All right. So I'll go ahead and get started. Today, I'm going to paint a lava elemental. And as the title says, I'm going to do this the lazy way. Uh, lava can be kind of a tricky thing to paint, especially to make it look good. Um, so the way that I've found to make lava look the best is to hide most of it. So you have to paint as little lava as possible. So uh, I'm only going to use six colors for this. Um, this is a, just listed as an elemental, possibly a stone elemental, I don't remember. But an elemental from uh, the Pathfinder line of miniatures, the pre-primed ones. So this is exactly how it comes uh, in the box. The only thing I did is it comes with this size base. Uh, I put it on a slightly bigger base just to get in my paint handle better. Uh, and you do get two of them, actually, in the box. I think it's $4, $5 for two of them, so it's a pretty good deal. Um, but I'm going to paint him as a lava elemental. So I'm going to start with a medium dark sort of red color, Mephiston red in this case. And I'm just going to paint the entire miniature in this color. And then we'll go on from there. Like I said, it's going to be six colors. Uh, we might end up only with five, actually. Or we might end up with a couple more. Depending on what time it is, you can always, as with all these streams, uh, you can always spruce it up more and more and more and more. Um, there aren't going to really be any stopping points on this one uh, before he's done. Because, well, there aren't, just, they're just not really an opportunity. Once the effect of the lava is done, then the miniature is done. So, but like I said, depending on the time, we might be able to go back and spruce it up a little bit. But I'm honestly not really sure how I would spruce it up. This is the way I've painted lava whenever I need it because I'm not very good at blending between like a dark, a light, like a red, an orange, and a yellow. Not really skilled at doing that. So I've just developed this way to, to cheat it, basically. And this miniature, with all his rock bits and faces and all that um, is very very well suited for this technique there is another miniature um, from the bones line reaper bones which is sort of the same idea as this um, it's a little bigger and the rocks on him are a little more spaced out um, but honestly it could still work on him really you just need a miniature that has some space between like segmented rocks like this um, to make this technique work. So that's why I picked him today. Um, because there's two of them in this, in the box, like I said, when you buy them, um, I was thinking about doing an ice golem or an ice elemental and a lava elemental. And I may do that in the future. I'm not going to do that in this episode though. I think Trying to paint two color schemes that are completely divergent like that is going to confuse me too much. So <laughs> that may be a future stream will be uh, will be an ice elemental. Once everyone's forgotten that I painted this miniature, I'll whip the other one out and paint him as an ice elemental. So like I said, we're just covering the entire miniature in this red color. And it's unfortunate, really. It's technically a waste of paint because we're going to see so little of this red when we're done. But it is what it is. It's a... Uh, whoop! Came right off of the paint holder. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Um, we're going to see so little of this red once the effect is all done. But it's for a good cause. It's going to look good. Not that good a cause, but... As far as good causes go, fully painted miniatures aren't that far up there. Like curing cancer, feeding the homeless, those kind of things. But as good of a cause as we're going to get right now. so And paint is not that expensive. Um, so people will sometimes balk at paint costs because, for instance, you can go to Hobby Lobby or Walmart and buy a tube of paint for a dollar. And then they come into 
their local store or a some sort of store that sells um, miniature paint, and they're like, holy snap, it's $5 for a tiny little bottle? But the the difference is if you buy a tube of paint at Hobby Lobby or Walmart and then try to put it on a miniature, you're going to be there for twice, three times, four times as long as you might be with miniature paint. Uh, you are, you're paying more, but you're paying for quality. It's not just the exact same paint thrown in a bottle. So while you absolutely can paint with, uh, with almost any paint, you could, if you're dedicated enough, you could paint miniatures with watercolors. There's absolutely no reason you couldn't. It just comes down to how long do you want to spend and how much work do you want the paint doing and how much work do you want to be doing? Um, right now the paint is doing 99% of the work. All I'm having to do is brush it on. If I was doing watercolors or Walmart paint or something, I'd have to be constantly reapplying and making sure I don't touch anything that's already on the miniature because it'll come off and then it'll leave tide, leave tide marks, which I then have to go back over and I have to go over them with paint that doesn't cover very well. So it would just be a process that I personally don't want to go into. So I spend the, the extra money on the miniature paint and then it allows me to be lazy which at the end of the day is what I'm here for. All right, so that's all. He's all redded up here. We're going to let this dry for a second, um, and then we're going to move on to the next guy. Actually, because of the technique we're doing, I'm not even going to let him dry. I'm just going to go straight into the orange. So I'm going to use Troll Slayer orange for this. And so this is where the the first real actual technique part of this technique comes in. Um, we're just going to paint basically the lines of this orange uh, sort of all over him. Just making sure that the line goes fully in between the cracks between the rocks. So I'm just going to start like this. And I'm just going to go... It's going to blend a little bit because the red is not completely dry. I'm just going to go like this. Find a different area. And you don't even necessarily have to do lines. You could do, like, sections. Just want to do this. Just make sure that your orange gets a, gets a good bit of coverage. Just go back over it if you need to. And like I said, it's going to mix with the red because the red is not completely dry but not a big deal most of this is going to be covered anyway so just gonna go down in here and this because this paint is this orange I'm using the troll slayer orange is a little bit thinner than the red we use I might Hit this with the hairbrush or hair hairbrush hair dryer real quick just so we don't have as much blending now that i see what it's doing uh we'll see here in just a second see if that's going to be required or not i'm just going to get down here i want to be covering probably 75 percent of the red Maybe not that much, maybe 60% of the red with the orange. Yeah, probably about 60%. Just kind of here, there, and everywhere. Stick some in. And don't forget about his face. Do a line across there. And do a line back here. And we're just going to do his base, sort of like he's he's coming out of the rock that he's in. Like being formed from the rock he's in. So we'll just do the base in the same style. Just make sure to get some orange. You just don't want to leave any big patches of red. Mm, 
missed a spot under his chin here of red, so we're just going to make it orange. Rather than reopen our red. So there's there's the orange applied. Let's rinse off the brush. And this, now we're going to move on to the yellow. And I am going to hit this with the hairdryer before I go to the yellow, because otherwise the yellow will never show up. So, uh, from my past usage of the hairdryer on stream, it has not been super loud. But... If you are using headphones, this is a warning, it might be loud. So I'm just going to dry this for about 45 seconds or so, just to get the top layer dried so we can apply the yellow to it. And I'm going straight from red to orange to yellow, but you could absolutely add five, six, seven, eight more colors to get this blend super, super smooth all the way up from the darkest red to the brightest yellow. I'm just doing it the simple way, though, because, again, title, the lazy way. So I'm going to pull out Avalon Sunset. This will be my yellow. Um, will it? Now I'm reconsidering. So Avalon Sunset is sort of a, a dead yellow. It's Yeah, we'll start with it. We might move to a brighter yellow, depending on uh, how it goes here. So I'm just going to grab some of this yellow and just basically where the, where the orange is, I'm just going to drag a line through the center with the yellow. Just like this. Just making sure that it goes all the way down into the cracks. Basically we want red showing and then orange showing and then in the middle of the orange we want the yellow showing. And I, you can also put it in a couple places where there is no orange just to mix it up a little bit. Okay. Make sure we get it up here on his face. Okay. That looks about right. Maybe a little bit right here and right there. Alrighty, so there's his, there's the lava laid down. Um, so now I'm going to go back to the hairdryer for a minute just to get this all completely dried. Or at least close to completely dried. So now we're going to move on to the actual rock itself, and so we're going to do it like volcanic rock, sort of. So we're going to start with a sort of a medium gray-black sort of color, which is called Corvus Black. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the top of every rock section you see here. So not going down into the crevices, just the tops of the rocks. And this is going to take a little bit of time, but hopefully in the end we'll have a nice lava elemental that we can be happy with. So you just move from rock to rock painting this color on. I got a stray bristle on my brush there. Just paint right up to the edges of these rocks. And you can go down into the into the cracks a little bit, like right here. You can cover that a little bit. You just don't want to go 
all the way down to the bottoms so that we can still see in between the rocks here. And then hopefully, once we do this in enough places, we'll have a nice lava pattern. And as I said on the leading up to my last stream, the stream is either going to tell you exactly how to do something or exactly not how to do something. So, you know, if we, if we finish this whole miniature and it looks terrible, now you know how to not paint lava and you're welcome. But hopefully we come out of this with a way to paint lava. Like I said, I have done this before. On miniatures but every miniature is different sometimes you think a technique is gonna work and it just doesn't so thankfully um, I haven't played much D&D as I've said before but from just from the vibe I get the D&D table is a very forgiving place for paint jobs doesn't have to be winning painting awards to to make it to the D&D table necessarily. As long as you got some paint on there and players can use their imagination for the rest, you're you're all set. Just being very careful not to go down into the crevice between these rocks. If you do hit one or two, it's not a big deal just becomes a bigger rock at that point but you want to avoid that as much as you can honestly D&D as long as we get a good visual we're happy yeah exactly doesn't have to be anything super fancy as long as the DM says the lava golem flies out of the rock in front of you and hits you in the head with his rock. As long as you know it's not like a blue water elemental or something that they use on the table, then players can figure it out from there. And I'm sure there are people out there saying, back in my day, we didn't even have miniatures for D&D. We play with our imagination only. You know, if that works for you, fantastic. But I personally like to play with miniatures. My dad is the one who got me into painting miniatures, and he would honestly probably say, Back in my day. <laughs> so... Whatever. As you can see, like I said, this is quite a time-consuming process, this step. The other steps were kind of loosey-goosey, and uh, neatness was not required. But this one, you really got to slow down and only paint the spots you're supposed to. But thankfully, this is only a single figure. So if, if I was painting for a session, I would maybe pick an easier model for the next one I painted. Uh, speaking of that, actually, painting models for next sessions, if you or anybody you know plays D&D &D and needs some models painted, um... I need models to paint on stream. If they don't mind a quick hour-long paint job on their figures and they want them painted and they don't want to have to pay for it, send me a message or post in the comments. So I always need new figures to paint on stream. And if you have some or someone you know has some, we can probably 
work that out. Uh, the only caveat being that I'm happy to take a suggestion of the paint scheme, but ultimately I'm going to paint it how I think is going to work best on stream. So if you're super particular about a, I need this painted a certain way, then that's absolutely fine. Um, I will happily paint it for you, but it will be at my commission rate, not a, and not done on stream. Both are absolutely fine. So yeah, if you need any models painted and you don't mind a quick paint job, let me know. I read that D&D was originally inspired by a miniature war game, specifically Chainmail. Interesting. I did not know that. I did not know that. Huh. I would have expected that, uh, that D&D were, or D&D were, D&D was, rather, a reaction to miniature games. So I know miniature games have been around for a while, um, but... I would have thought that D&D was a reaction to not having complete control over individual figures and wanting a story element out of your your gaming. Um but that may be that may be it maybe people saw a game like the one you mentioned Chainmail and said, "Hmm, if we added some story to this and individualize it a little bit we could have a pretty cool game here i got that converted objective based miniature thing you can try if you want since it's different uh the converted objective base miniature thing yes i don't know what that is but yes We might be coming up on, on halfway done here, potentially. Maybe not halfway <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> this is gonna be, this is gonna be one of the boring, most boring streams with one of the most exciting endings. Like the finished product is going to be leaps and bounds above the process in terms of interestingness. Usually, like you can kind of see where a miniature is going while it's being painted and so you get pretty like a couple snapshots leading up to it like oh yeah this is how it's going to look and then the end is still cool but you know you've known how it's going to look this is going to be all right so greg painted gray for 45 minutes and then we got a lava elemental at the end i should have cooking showed it should have used the other one that i have here and uh done all the way up through this step on that one before the stream so that didn't have to sit you guys didn't have to sit through all this painting of gray it has a shield slash terrain slash spear slash helmet used for an objective marker i guess interesting okay that seems like a possibility And uh, one of the things you could do with this miniature, um, because he's sort of, he has a sort of rock formation around him that may or may not be part of him. You could differentiate him from the base, and that would make him maybe more interesting. But I decided that I wanted him to be, like, built into the base almost. So that it looks like he was coming out of this rock formation, so I'm doing all of the... All of the base rock in the same color scheme. Probably put a, should have put some orange or yellow down here, but that's okay. Maybe this is a particularly cool spot of molten rock. 
so it's only the dark color. I think that's right. I assume, but I don't know for sure. I'm not a scientist. I assume that uh, temperatures of molten rock are the same as fire. The brighter you go, the hotter you are. But hey, molten rock could be different for all I know. Okay, so there's you can start to see the idea of the of the technique here. You can see the lava poking through the rocks in him. We're gonna come back and darken him darken darken the whole thing up and flatten it a bit. As as you can see he's he's quite shiny right now and that doesn't really make sense for rock. So we're gonna see if we can mat it down a little bit. Obviously, you could mat it down with matte varnish or something, but matte varnish, in my mind, doesn't fit the the lazy ethos of this paint job. So, I'm just going to do it with paint. If it ruins it, oh well, that's what you get for being lazy, I guess. There was someone, speaking of lazy, can't remember who it was. Could also be completely made up. Would not surprise me at all, but some CEO or something said that he'd rather hire a lazy person because they'd be trying to find workarounds and shortcuts to get the work done so they could be lazy. And that would ultimately be more productive than a person who wasn't lazy. I'm not sure, A, anyone real actually said that, and B, I'm not sure I'd buy that it would actually speed up productivity. But, you know, I think maybe... The lazy people of the world came up with it to make themselves feel better. And being one of the lazy people of the world, I approve. Just going to rinse my brush off. It's been a while. Just to make sure we don't get any dry paint. I heard about that too, but I forgot who. Yeah, somebody. Somebody famous, I assume. But, uh... But I'm not sure who it was. So. I'll just say it was Bill Gates. That sounds good. Bill Gates works for me. The rocks on the front of him look... Look a lot more... Straightforward than the ones on the back. So hopefully... The front of him will take a little less time than the, the back did. I really should have thought through this paint job more, though. Watching me paint gray rock for 45 minutes is really not interesting. This would have been a good time lapse. Although, I don't think... I don't know the physics behind live-action time-lapse, but there would be some time travel involved somewhere. So. I don't think I'm quite up for that. It actually is Bill Gates. I looked it up. That's funny. But did he, like, do we know, did he actually say that? Or is it one of those things, like, one of those misinterpreted or misassigned quotes, like, that someone made up and posted on the internet, and so, who knows? If he did actually say that, though, that's pretty funny. All right, we're closing in here on the end of this color. 
Then we're going to do a dry brush and a wash and call it a day. And hopefully we come out of it with a cool looking model. This guy's face looks like the guy from Thor Ragnarok. The uh, I don't remember his name, but the rock gladiator dude. I guess he's in Endgame also. Um, looks like him. I don't remember his name, though. Sorry. Minor character whose name I forgot. I think he was voiced by the director of the movie, though. For some reason, I have that in my brain, but not his name. Here, these rocks get a little flatter and there's not as much definition between them. So just being careful not to overlap the cracks in them. Fact check says there's no evidence that he said that, but they don't know if it's false either. Who knows? All right, so. Because I'm lazy, see, here we go, full circle. Because I'm lazy, I'm not going to go look it up. And therefore, I'll assume it's correct, which will then further my thoughts that being lazy is okay. But maybe that quote was put online by all the non-lazy people to keep us lazy people down. That's what it is. It's the lazyarchy. Or the anti-lazyarchy? Whoever it is. Someone's trying to keep us lazy people down. I don't like it. We might end up with another color on this guy. I might do his eyes in some color that stands out a bit more. But I also might not. We'll see. It's the Illuminati. Yeah, there you go. The Illuminati trying to keep the lazy people down. So rude. So rude. I'm not sure if it's because I've been holding this model without stopping for a while. Or if I've had too much caffeine this morning or not enough caffeine, but I have the the shakes in my left hand for some reason. Not in my right hand, in my painting hand for some reason, but in my left hand here. You can feel it wanting to <laughs> wanting to shake around. Um, I know that is actually a problem for some people um, who have hand tremors or something. It makes it very hard to paint. Um, if that is you or if you know someone who has that issue um a youtuber named a channel named black magic craft uh last week or two weeks ago made a video all about how to combat hand tremors or shaky hands or stuff like that while painting because he has a uh, he has that um quite severely i'm not sure what the the cause of his is if he has a the underlying medical condition or what but he said he has hand tremors pretty badly and he's developed a as far as i know the the big part of it is he's developed a brace position that works really well for him and so um you should go check out that video if that and even for people who don't necessarily have like diagnosed hand tremors or anything Having a really good brace position just for doing small details and stuff can always be helpful. So even if you even if it doesn't necessarily affect you, you should go check out that video. You never know when the information might come in handy. Somewhere I have the original chainmail rules, little book, light blue cover, if I recall correctly. Interesting. There's a um one of the original ward games that I am familiar with 
is the one published by or written by H.G. Wells. Oh, he was a big miniature gamer. I think it's just called War Game. Um, and then a game that has since developed into a miniature game, but was an original military uh, practice device is called Kriegspiel, which literally just translates to war game, uh, which was a which was used slash played by the Prussian officer corps to uh, teach tactics. And uh, the original rules still exist, and you can play it today. It's actually a load of fun. Um, that looks so very awesome. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for a, a very old war game to play, look up Kriegspiel. It is a lot of fun. It deals with with everything that you might encounter on the battlefield. Um, I've played it... The The way you play it is you can't just play uh, one versus one. You need a, a DM, basically. Through it. And you play it on... You play it in a style called double blind, which is meaning that both players don't know where each other's pieces are until you would actually know. Um, so, for instance, um, when I played it, I played it... Uh, there's all sorts of them now. It's been converted to basically every time period. But I played uh, Napoleonic War 1, and uh, I was playing as a French, and so I had a French infantry column, and the DM would say things like, uh, there's a hill off to your left... Um, you have X amount of skirmishers in your, in each regiment. You can send them, blah, blah, blah. And so I send skirmishers up a hill, which then allows me to be able to hear better because up on high ground, I can hear the sound better and I can also see better, obviously. So then he might say, you see movement two miles away on the ridge line. And then the scouts would have returned to the lines and blah, blah, blah. And then when you actually encounter an enemy, you move your pieces off of your double blind board that your opponent can't see. And your opponent does the same. And you come to a third board that the DM has. You place your pieces. Well, the DM places your pieces exactly where they were. And then you fight your, your battle. And pieces only enter that battle board when they would realistically be engaged and spotted. So you're playing your battle on your on the DM's board, but you move your pieces, your any reinforcing pieces or whatever, on your own board until they would be physically spotted by your opponent. So it allows for it allows for recreation of historical battles much more easily because War games suffer from the bird's eye view problem of the general can see the entire board. And so flanking becomes almost impossible. The only way you are going to pull off a flank in a historical game, a war game, is if you just have overwhelming forces and your opponent physically can't deal with what you have. But in Kriegspiel, or any double blind system, Kriegspiel is just the one I know of, you don't see the flank coming until you see the flank. And by that point, it's too late. They may already be behind you or whatever. And uh, so it's a, it's a very, very interesting system. And it, it you can see why it was used so, uh, so much by the Prussian professional officer corps to teach tactics. Because aside from the real thing... It's, uh, it gives you a pretty good idea. Obviously, you uh, you lose. There's no replacement for the actual stress of the battlefield. But in terms of reacting to your opponent's decisions and making your own decisions on the fly, it does give you some semblance of the real thing where you wouldn't just know exactly where everybody is. 
So it's quite interesting. And it, like I said, it makes playing some games possible. Like a lot of games, historical games. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the Zulu Wars, uh, time period, and and the Boer War and stuff like that. And the problem is the, if you've ever seen the movie Zulu, they they talk about this, but it is a real. It was a real thing. They talk about how the Zulu like to fight in the style of the head of a buffalo. They bring the head in as a feint or just a frontal assault. And then the horns of the buffalo circle around and envelop you from the sides. And that was a real strategy. That is actually how Zulu nations like to fight. But the problem with a war game is, well, I'm going to see the horns of the buffalo coming. So I can just deploy men to stop that from happening. But if you're playing double blind or Kriegspiel style, you don't know the you don't know the envelopment is coming, other than you know the tactics of your enemy. But if you deploy to stop the envelopment and then there is no envelopment, now you've wasted resources blocking an attack that isn't coming. So it definitely leads to some much more in depth strategy than just a just a normal war game. Chess is considered a war game. Yes, as far as I know, yeah, that's its origin is a uh, is a uh, a simulation of war style. But uh I don't know for sure though on that. Yep. There's there's Creek Spiel. The wiki has been linked. There it is. There's actually you can they're very expensive, but uh you can get original Kriegspiel tables um, that were specifically made for Kriegspiel that have all cert all types of terrain tiles that you lay down, and it's like the the origin of procedural generation almost, <laughs> um, where the the officer in charge of the simulation would lay down certain tiles that would determine the terrain of the battle and stuff like that. So it's very interesting. You can just get a modern PDF and play it on whatever, but if you wanted to go nuts, you can spend thousands of dollars on a specific Kriegspiel table. All right, now that I've gone off on my historical war game rant, I think we're done with the gray. <laughs> At least mostly. There's always going to be spots I could try to grab and touch up. But there's the rock done. So as you can see, we covered almost all of the lava. But left... Let's zoom in a little bit. But left some of the yellow and orange showing. Just so it looks like it's a a more fluid surface underneath the the rock crust. So now... I think I'm going to let it dry for just a couple minutes here. A couple seconds, really. And I'm going to get a dry brush so we can do a little bit of dry brushing with a gray just to change the, the look of the rock a little bit just so it's not completely monochromatic. And then from there, we're going to put... Oh, no, I just noticed I missed a spot of rock here. I'm gonna pull back my my black and just get in here. Do that real quick. There we go. All right. I'm glad I decided to not do both the lava and ice elementals today because I would not have time to have done the ice elemental after this after this rock. 145, yeah, we spent a long time painting that rock, but I think it was to to a good result here. So I'm going to take some dark gray, some Skaven Blight Dinge. Um, here it is compared to the Corvus Black. So, you know, definitely a couple steps down, uh, but still pretty dark. Um, and I'm going to take a big old brush like this. And I'm just going to dry brush. We just, just finished putting this gray on so I'm going to be gentler than I might normally be um, 
with this dry brush because I don't want to rub off the black paint. That would be bad. I just love the genre name literally means war play in German. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty funny. I'm sure, I guess I'm not sure. My guess is the original game probably had a much longer name with uh, knowing the Germans. But Kriegspiel is how it is historically remembered. So I'm just going in with this dry brush and I'm just going across these rocks. And because our lava is in the, the crevices of these and not on the surface, we can dry brush with impunity here and not worry about getting this gray too much on our lava. So, just going in just to change the look of this rock just a little bit. Oh, yeah, it rubbed off a little bit right there. That's okay. I could go back and fix it, but also, you know, the lava's poking through right there. Not a big deal. All right, so I'm not sure how much that really comes across on camera, but it did change change the color a little bit of that rock. So then I'm going to potentially, I'm going to try it. Uh, I'm going to put some Basilicum Gray, which is a contrast paint. You could use um, Null Oil for this or pretty much any dark wash color. Um, I'm going to put some of this on it and just see how it does. Um, it is going to run down into the cracks and potentially cover the uh, lava. So we're going to see here. We want to put it down, but we don't want it to cover the lava too much. And if it does start to cover the lava too much, we may abandon this, this idea. But I think it's going to work. I think pulling it back off after I put it down is going to work out pretty good. Just so it gets on the rocks and stuff to mat them down a little bit, but doesn't cover our lava very much. And so I'm not really applying this like you would a normal contrast paint or a wash, but I am preserving our lava color. Tap some of this back off here. Okay. A couple more places here. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, you're going to abandon it after it's all over the model. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, get a wet brush and wipe it back off is how I would abandon this in this sense um, in this case I'm just kind of taking the dry brush and wiping back off just so we still get the the lava coming through I think we're basically there to be honest we could like I said we could go in and highlight these rocks up a lot more and do all sorts of stuff that's why he has two models you eat one of them to go on to the next exactly see so just get this one out of here and start over but no, um, I will hit this with a hairdryer real quick just to dry that uh, that wash down and we'll see what the final product looks like. I think he'll probably still be not as matte as we'd like, but he'll be fine. go so now you can see he uh he's still a little bit shiny but my light is also right here so he's gonna always gonna look a little shinier than he really is but i think you can definitely notice the difference we at least took him from semi-gloss to satin which is good enough for me um like i said if you really wanted a matte you could throw a matte varnish down on him and that would really really finish him off but this i think is good enough for me you could do more dry brushes on these rocks. You could highlight it up more, but I'm happy with this look. Looks like a lava monster. 
coming out of his his shell, as it were. Um, I was going to do his base, but I don't have the correct color of texture paint. And I, the texture paint is not going to dry anywhere close to reasonable. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave him here. Um, and that'll be that. I'll probably finish him off at some point with the better, with the correct color of texture paint that I want. I just want the black texture paint. And uh, so I'll finish him at some point. But otherwise, that will be that will be him done. Our lava elemental is complete the lazy way. But so few of us are as Matt are as Matt as we'd like. We're stuck being Clark or Greg or Michael. Maybe so super glowy eyes or something. <laughs> You're right. You're you are correct. Yeah, glowy eyes. Hmm. Okay. Let's see what we can do real quick. Glowy eyes before we before we call it a day here. I'm gonna use Dorn Yellow. I happen to happen to know that the person suggesting glowy eyes enjoys himself some Dorn, so we'll go with that. Works. Alright. Alright, let's see what we got here. Still on camera? Yep, still on camera. Wonderful. Just gonna be very careful here. Go in there. Hard to tell on camera. But, you know, I lightened his eyes a little bit. There you go. There you can see it in the light. Now he looks a little more imposing i guess you can actually tell he's looking at you all right so that will do it for this episode lava monster completed um thank you everybody for watching i'll be back in the warhammer group on friday uh working on my game mat some more monday i'll be back painting some warhammer figure uh in the evening and then next week one hour ago today I'll be back here painting some D&D stuff or maybe some historical stuff. Who knows? Um, like I said, if you have D&D &D miniatures you want painted, uh, if you don't mind them being painted quickly and on stream and however, um, send me a message. Let me know. I'll happily paint them. Also, if you want things painted and you want me to go slower and paint them how you want exactly that, send me a message and you can pay me to paint them. Either one is perfectly fine with me. Either way, thank you everybody for watching, and I will see you next time.